Hello everyone, I'm Lou Holder, DC area sports personality and communications professor here at Prince George's Community College. I'm coming to you from the PGCC TV studios on the Largo campus to introduce a fascinating interview recently conducted with comedian, actor, and producer Thomas Nephew Tommy Miles. Best known for his prank phone calls on his uncle Steve Harvey's morning show, laughter is important to him, but it's not all that defines him. As you will see during this conversation, held inside the Presidium Theater in the new Center for Performing Arts, Miles has built an impressive career that encompasses radio, television, film, and so much more. Now with some help from some of the mass communication students here at Prince George's Community College, please enjoy this Real Talk Forum with one of the more versatile media personalities of our time. Your bio um, says it all. You're a triple threat. You've done it all. You know, you've done <laughs> it all. I hope so. Uh, and so I want to at least start there by taking us through your journey mm. with some of these, some of these uh, segments of the media that you have uh, excelled in. I want to start with the radio first. Okay. Obviously, for everybody who um, knows or does not know, it's Nephew Tommy. <laughs> nephew Tommy being the nephew of Steve Harvey, yep. uh, the famous comedian. So first, I think we need to start there. How influential was your uh, uncle in everything that you've done? Uh, a lot. I mean, you got a guy that, um, I mean, shot like a rocket as far as stand-up comedy. And you just sit back and watch. You take notes. You see what he's doing. And... Uh, you learn, you learn the good part, you learn the bad part, you wrap it all up and you say, okay, let me, let me give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And um, stand-up comedy, I have no idea. I was, I was um, working in the summertime with a buddy that had a lawn service and we were cutting yards and he says, man, you ought to go try some stand-up <laughs> comedy. I was like, no, I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a thespian, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, you ought to give it a shot. They had an amateur night in my, in my city, Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, all right, all right, let's try it. So I go down, I do three to five minutes, which I thought was forever, you know. And I won, you know. I call my uncle and say, I won. <laughs> and then, you know, of course, he said, you still ain't ready. You ain't ready yet. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I won and it gave me the drive to keep doing it and keep practicing. And the next thing I know, I was, I was in a comedy club every weekend. Uh, I looked up, I had performed on Showtime at the Apollo. Mm -hmm. I had done uh, BET's Comic View. And um, you know, I, 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 two, three years later, I was opening up for Luther Vandross. Wow. And I was like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, and Luther took me for three years. I went around the, the country with him um, performing, and then he went overseas. And I used to, I, I was real good friends with the band. I hung out with the band when I was on tour with Luther, and they were getting ready to go to Europe. And I was like, wow, I know I ain't going to be able to go to Europe. You don't need me over there. And uh, next thing I know, the tour manager calls me and says, hey, the boss wants to take you with us. I was like, really? So I go to Europe, when I land, the, um, the drummer who was, a, his name was Ivan Hamden. Ivan Hamden, incredible drummer. He comes to me and says, so what you gonna do? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm do the jokes I've been doing. He was <laughs> like, that ain't gonna work. I was like, what you mean? He said, nobody wanna hear them country jokes you've been telling back <laughs> in the United States. He said, we in Europe now. You need something that they gonna laugh to. I was like, are you serious? So for two days, I walked around London pen in a pad. I refused to go down. I refused to, to die on stage. Mm -hmm. And man, I, uh, I walked around London and I wrote down everything I thought was funny. And the first night I did 20 minutes, that was my time. And I had half the audience standing up and I said, I ain't got them yet. Second night, yeah! Everybody was on their feet when I left the stage. I walked off stage and Mr. Vandross said, you got him, huh? I said, yeah, I got him in 20, but if you late, it's going to be bad out here. <laughs> That's, yep. awesome. That's awesome. So everybody uh, knows you on the radio for your pranks. Yes. Your pranks are legendary. Oh, my God. I, I have had to swerve out of traffic a couple of times. <laughs> Because the stuff, um, I think I might have spilled some coffee because uh, the stuff was so funny. But um, it's almost like picking children for you. Can you name one prank call that stands out to you more than any other? Mm, I got a bunch of them, man. Yeah. Uh, your wife, Tina, is my brother, Tim. 
I don't know where that came from. I don't know how I thought of that. Yo, wife, that's me calling this guy and telling him that we've been looking for my brother for like four to five years. And I called him and asked him, I said, are you, are you married to this, this, this girl named Tina? He's like, yeah, yeah, we've been married five years. I was like, I said, my brother been gone five years. <laughs> and he said, what are, you, what are you saying? I was like, I said, does your wife have a scar over her left hip? He's like, yeah, 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 she got a scar. What, what is this about? I said, I think your wife, Tina, <laughs> is my brother, Tim. <laughs> And of course, all the beeps kick in after that. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I got some crazy ones, man. That, um, my dad, my pops passed away going on five years ago. Uh-huh. And um, <clears throat> his favorite one was, uh, uh, can I have your kidney? And that's me calling this deacon at the church who's getting ready to go have, uh, he's getting ready to have surgery. And I can't remember what, what organ it was, but it definitely wasn't his kidney. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm calling from the church, and I want to pray for him. And, uh, and, I, and while I'm praying, you know, I said, uh, you know, we want to we wanna, we wanna lay hands uh, on his pancreas. We want to lay hands on it right now, Lord. Lay hands on his pancreas. And he said, hold, 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 hold on, hold on. <laughs> ain't, 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 ain't nothing wrong with my, with my pancreas. I say, I say, okay, and, and, and then and he tells me what it is. I say, I say well, I'm glad you said that. I said, since, since they're going to have you laying there and you're going to be open, do you mind <laughs> if they reach around and, get to- and grab one of your kidneys? Because I need one. <laughs> <laughs> and he cussed me smooth oh, out, man. man. In the name of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. So I got some great ones, and yeah. uh, I think people are liking them. Um, it's, I never thought I'd be this old playing on the phone, mm-hmm. but um, you know, it's it started out. It started out where um, Ricky Smiley, yeah, um, invited a bunch of comedians to his home in Birmingham, Alabama. He wanted to do a compilation album for prank phone calls, and he invited me to be one of the comics. And each one of us comedians would come and do one prank. Mm-hmm. And it was about fifteen of us there. And uh, I, we did it. I thought that was incredible. I'd never done a prank call before. And I thought it was cool. I get back to, uh, to radio, you know, the next week with Uncle Steve. And he was like, hi, I go down there with Ricky. <laughs> I said, it was good, man. I said, we did these prank calls. I said, it was fun. I ain't never done nothing like that. That's what you need to do on the radio. Won't you start doing some prank calls? <laughs> And there I, we go. And that was the birth of it. I did one or two, and they were home run hitters. And the next thing I know, he had it in my contract mm-hmm. that I had to do so many prank calls a week. I had to do it, or he wasn't going to pay me. So now I got 300 and something prank phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can see them. You can go in uh, Walmart. I'm up to volume six or seven. They, wow. They're all over the place. All right, let's move over to television and the theater arts. I love what they said that you studied at the Royal Shakespeare Company of London. Studied with the Royal Shakespeare, yes. Yeah. yes what that, was that like? That's different. Um, you know, you have um, uh, um, so many people from, from London come down and, and we perform, uh, we get together and we perform a particular show. And they came to Texas a and which is my alma mater, and this whole company of Shakespeare comes in and they take over and I was paranoid, I was scared. I didn't know if I could have the, the chops mm-hmm. to stand up to what they were doing. But we had been doing so much um, Shakespeare, Tennessee Williams, um, yeah. um, you know, the list goes on, Lorraine Hansberry, we were doing a lot. And at my school, you know, I was, I was the, the first African American at, at Texas A&M to be in theater. And the problem I had- Awesome, let's give it up for that, pro- yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And the problem I had was I was, I was, I was getting ticked off because I couldn't, I couldn't get a leading role. And I was like, man, I'm about to change my major, <laughs> you know, because I, I, can't, I, I can't be the leading role because we're not doing black plays. So this guy, Charles Gardone, he's the first black Pulitzer Prize playwright. He comes to Texas A&M and he starts teaching theater. And he brought what you call cross-cultural casting. Mm. which means the father can be black, the, the daughter can be white, the, the, the wife can be Hispanic. It, it made no difference what it was. As long as you had the talent, you could do it. Mm-hmm. So I stuck it out, 
And the next thing I know, the Royal Shakespeare Company of London comes in and we do King Lear. And I get the role of Edgar. And boom, I heard myself proclaimed. And by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. Go ahead. No port is free, no place that guard, and most unusual vigilance is not attend my taking. While I must escape, I must preserve myself. And with presented nakedness, outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof of bedlam beggars to strike arms at mortified bare arms. Oh, God bless thee, lady. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Like it was yesterday. Like it was yesterday. Wow. Like it was yesterday. I got so much in my head, it's crazy. Yeah. Ready to love. Oh my God. When I, when I, when the word came out that you were coming, mm -hmm. five out of six people were like, ready to love. I'm ready to love. <laughs> ready to love. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Tommy. I'm Tommy Miles, the host of OWN's brand new reality series, Ready to Love. This one's for the grown folk who are truly ready to stop playing games and make love their first priority. Could you tell people what the show is about for those who don't know and then uh, um, expand from there? Ready to Love is a show that's um, out of Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta is known to be a, a city that is the balance of the ratio of, of women to men. is it's 20, it's 20 women to every man in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm. And everyone there says that they cannot find love. They can't find what they're looking for. So Will Packer created this show called Ready to Love and gave me a phone call and said, hey, I got a job for you. And I was like, dude, if this is a prank call. On you. <laughs> this, is, this is the dirtiest prank call. He says, no, 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 I got a job for you. I want you to host this show. I said, okay, are you serious? So man, next thing I know I'm hosting this show and they have 10, uh, uh, 10 women, Matter of fact, I'm I take that back. The first season, we did 12 women, eight men, 20 singles. Because of the ratio, we made it imbalanced. And all of them were seeking love. And they go out, it's a process of elimination. We start, you know, women eliminate men, men eliminate women. And, and the objective is, is to dwindle down. And by the time we get to our final week, our final episode, we have three couples who have found love. That is the prize. The prize is love, because that's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And we dwindled down first season, and we had three, uh, three couples that found love, got us a second season, and we're in the middle of that right now. Mm -hmm. which, uh, we, and we, we kind of changed it a bit. We made it 10 and 10, where there's 10 men, 10 women. And each week, it's process of elimination, yeah. man. So we, each one that they're feeling each other, they go out, they come back. Yeah. It's really weird. And the, the biggest, the craziest thing that happened on this, this season is, imagine you're getting ready, you're, you're going out on a date. Mm -hmm. But I send you out on a date with this person that you like. But I also send your ex on the date. Now that's a date right there. That's a date. That's, uh, <laughs> that's conflict resolution. Exactly. <laughs> So, and that's what Ready to Love is, man, and, and uh, it's doing so well. Yeah. I, I think season three is around the corner. You enjoy playing matchmaker? I do, I do. I, I didn't know if I was going to like it. Yeah. Um, you know, when you, when you wear so many different hats, you right. know, people see Thomas Miles or Nephew Tommy, and you think, oh God, he's the, he's the fool on the radio. So to be able to turn it and give you another side yeah. of me and, and be the guy that's giving good advice, I think it's a good, you know, it's good for me to show right. you a different side. Right. Um, working with Tyler Perry, he's one of those people <laughs> who is in the same category as you as far as being able to wear multiple hats in the communication field yeah. well. So working oh. with working the creative, working with him, how, how was that? That was incredible. I did, uh, I did Boo, uh, Boo uh, Medea's Halloween, mm -hmm. and to see him yeah. uh, in action, because I got all these characters in my head, but to watch him put his at work amazing for him to come and sit here as Medea, do those lines, come right back out of his trailer, sit right here as Uncle Joe, come right back, boom, he's sitting right here, he's another character, I'm sitting there like, I'll be doggone, look at this, right in front of me, mm -hmm. right in front of me. So yeah, to watch him work and, and really put it out was, uh, was a treat for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, the late, great, um, Jackie Robinson said that a life is only as important 
as the impact that it has on other lives, right? Mm -hmm. So this miles for giving and the way in the, in the uh, beginning, how that happened with the overseas oh tours God. and everything like yeah. that. Um, the laughs and everything are fun, but that's what's gonna stand the test of time. How many lives have you affected with your, you know, philanthropic and your nonprofit? Yeah. So could you talk a little about how proud you are of the Miles for Giving? I love, uh, I love my foundation. Uh, for those <laughs> that don't, don't, do not know, Miles of Giving, we give back to, um, to wounded warriors. Yeah. And um, I went over to, I did two USO tours. I went to Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Germany. I mean, the list goes on and on. And um, my first time there, I was with uh, uh, Robert Ory, basketball yeah. player. Yeah. Um, Big Shot Bob. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Minka Kelly. Minka Kelly is a young lady. She was with um, Friday Night Lights is a, is a show that she okay. was on. And Jordan Sparks. Oh. Incredible singer from um, American Idol. Felipe Sparks' is kid, right? Uh, I th I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Football player, yeah. And we go over, man, and I'm, I'm the comedian. I'm the black Bob Hope, you know. <laughs> and I'm, we're performing for the troops. And that's, that's, that's the good part. That's the fun part. Yeah. But, you know, you still want to go and you want to visit soldiers. And we went and we visited this guy. And he had just had surgery. His legs had been blown off. And, and we're, in his, we're in his room, and he's just coming out. He's just, he's just waking up from his surgery. His legs are gone. And he's waking up, and he's telling us, hey, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, um, I'd like to take pictures with you all. I, I can take a couple more, but after this, I got I to gotta get back. I got to get back to my men. He don't know what has happened. He has no idea. So we're crying. We're bawling right there because we know he doesn't know what's going on. It hasn't hit him yet. So when I get, we get back on this, this aircraft, and we're on, we're on Air Force Two. We're headed back to the States, and I start talking to some of the soldiers. I say, what's going to happen to that man when he get home? Well, you know, he'll, 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 he'll be taken care of. I say, but how long does that take? And they said, well, there's a system, there's a process that you have to go through before you're taken care of. And I said, but, but what about right now when you get home? So I created Miles of Giving. Mm. Miles of Giving is, uh, we're here for right now. Yeah. Which means I may not be able to give you a lot of money, but I, you'd be surprised what a thousand, two thousand, or three thousand dollars will do right now. Because some of the stuff that you need is immediate, you know? So that's what Miles is giving us all about. We give yeah. back right now. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, branding, you have turned a sidekick type of persona into a multimedia, <laughs> you know, multi-journalist type of uh, experience. A lot of the students that we have here, we're teaching them about that too. Mm -hmm. Don't have, be a one trick pony, be able right. to do multiple things well, right. you know, so you can be able to sustain yourself. Could you tell me how, you know, first of all, how amazing you are taking that nephew Tommy persona into what it is now and what kind of advice that you could give to students um, that are probably teetering between, I don't wanna do this, I wanna do that, that you could do it all and compact and compile it into one thing. Uh, you can. Um, I, I, you know, I started off. I, I think it all roots from theater is where I started. Yeah. So that's my craft, and I think the first thing is honing your craft. Honing your craft. That is that is the most important thing. If you have that, then you can go in so many different directions. Mm -hmm. So I I started in theater then obtain stand-up comedy. Um, uh, you take that, I picked up television, film, yep. and then this, this radio thing comes out of nowhere for me, you know, yep. that I wasn't, even, I wasn't even looking for it. I, I told you earlier about uh, Luther Vandross took me overseas, and I, I did the, I, I opened for him. When we got done overseas, we came back to the States, and Mr. Vandross said, hey, give us about three, four months, I'm gonna write a new album, be back out on the road. I was like, ah, okay. I said, well, I'm gonna take all my little money. I'm gonna go to Hollywood, and I'm gonna stay with my buddies. That are, they're all actors. 
and I'm going to crash at the crash pad. And, <laughs> you know, that's when you got seven, eight guys in a two-bedroom apartment. <clears throat> you sleep on the floor. You got your own <laughs> pillow. When you open up the refrigerator, you got stickies on everything. <laughs> if, that, if your name ain't on it, don't touch it. <laughs> and um, so I get a call from Uncle Steve's manager. He said, you in town? I said, yeah, I'll be here for a while before, uh, you know, Luther goes back out. He said, won't you come on up here and, uh, and get on the radio with your uncle? I was like, all right, what time we talking? He said, eh, get here by 5.30, 6 o'clock. I said, all right, I just eat dinner early. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> In the morning. I said, are you serious? <laughs> so I go get on the radio with him for about two weeks straight in Los Angeles, California. And that introduced the whole city of LA to the nephew. Mm -hmm. And it just went through the roof. They loved it, they mm -hmm. fell in love with me. And I told Steve and, and his manager, I said, look, I, I can play with y'all on the radio for a while, but when Luther called, I gotta go. I can't be just playing with y'all on the radio. Right. And it's so amazing how God blesses you when you don't even know it. Amen. Luther Vandross, got sick and passed away. God gave me a job before I even knew I needed one. So, so it's good to hone your craft, not be afraid to take steps on. I knew nothing about radio. I had no clue what I was doing. And I used to come in in the morning and I'd have a whole notebook, you know, just, just, full of stuff I written down and my uncle be like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I say, these, 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 these are jokes, these are jokes I'm gonna do today. He would take my papers, we ain't doing none of that. We finna turn this damn microphone on and we finna go to work. That's what me and you finna do. Hello. <laughs> So now, he is now training me to be quick in the mind. Yeah. So now I'm learning, I'm watching him and I'm watching him. He's just saying all this stuff and it's just, it's just rolling off his tongue. And I'm like, when, when, did you, when did you write all that? He say, I just wrote it. Mm -hmm. I said, you're just saying what you want to say? That's why we here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so now when I go to work, here I am. 15, 18 years later, when they turn the mic on, I don't care. Yeah. I need some green tea, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Right. So, so be ready. Just be ready. be ready. So anybody out there, that it, it, it doesn't, my, my, my trail has always been the big screen. That's always been it for me. But for me to start on the stage, yeah. and then for me to start doing stand-up, and then there's radio, I picked up some television gigs here and there, yeah. and then I've done some movies here and there, and, but that's my trail. I've had fun on, on the entire journey getting to where I'm trying to go. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, I think the key to it is, don't be afraid to say, um, I wanna do radio and that's all I wanna do. You never know, you might be a news anchor first, you might be this first. So don't be scared to go all over the spectrum before you get to where you're trying to go. Right, that's good stuff, that's good stuff. I'm gonna take you uh, Okay, out of the mix. Okay. Besides Steve Harvey. <laughs> okay. Favorite comedians of all time. Oh my God. Of all time. Of all time. I'm going all the way back. Richard Pry. I mean, uh, all of them. Oh Can my God. Can you give me a couple that are just. Richard, Richard is one of the tops. <laughs> I mean, you can't still to this day, he is the GOAT. You know what I mean? And I, I still go back and watch him. That comedy is so uh, in that era, but I still love it. Mm -hmm. He's still the man. Um, right now, I'm gonna tell you who else I think is amazing because every, every one, every two to three years he'll come out. Chris Rock will come out blazing <laughs> out of nowhere. You'll be like, wow, where'd you get all this? And he sits back and watches everything that has taken place in society and he goes back and he just nails it, you know? But I, Cedric the Entertainer, he's a bad boy too. Now, God rest his soul, that damn Bernie Mac, man. <laughs> <laughs> that Bernie Mac was a beast. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, 
Yeah. What would you tell your 18-year-old self? Would you make different choices, and if so, what? What would you tell your 18-year-old self? Be patient. Be obedient. Um, be ready for the long haul. That's all I can think of. Mm -hmm. Be patient. Be obedient. Be ready for the long haul. And don't ever forget about God. Right. Amen. 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 This Real Talk conversation is part of an ongoing speaker series presented by the Humanities Department to provide empowering opportunities for our students to gain insight and exposure from individuals actually working in the industry. And as you just witnessed, that insight and exposure was clearly captured. Special thanks to all the awesome folks at PGCC TV who make sure events like this on the college campus are captured and broadcast to you. To learn more about what's going on at Prince George's Community College, especially in the new Center for Performing Arts, please visit the website www.pgcc.edu forward slash arts. I'm Lou Holder. Have a blessed day and thanks for watching.